VM1 Ultra. This system on a chip represents the highest end computer processor Apple has designed to date. And according to Apple, it should be as fast as a high end Windows desktop. Packing 20 CPU cores, a 21 teraflop GPU, and 800 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, it certainly seems like it could be. But how does it measure up in real world testing? And how in the world does it manage to work within the tiny Mac Studio desktop computer? Apple only started fully designing their own chips relatively recently. With early iPhone models, Apple essentially outsourced the whole process to Samsung, who would develop the chip layout and manufacture it, licensing CPU designs from ARM and GPU designs from Imagination Technologies. Apple had minimal involvement in the actual development of the SoCs themselves. A few generations in, Apple began to take over more and more of the chip layout work, but things really changed in 2012. That year, Apple released their first CPU design, codenamed Swift, which debuted in the iPhone 5. Swift still used the ARM instruction set, but Apple developed the CPU design themselves. Now, Swift was reasonably quick, but the Cyclone CPU they released the following year was much more impressive, and subsequent Apple efforts have maintained their performance edge over other ARM-based CPUs. Since then, Apple has moved all chip design in-house to the extent realistically possible. Apple designs their own GPUs, their own CPUs, and handles SoC design and integration. This means that Apple has tremendous control over their chip designs, the kind of control you would need to scale a phone processor up for high-end desktops. Which brings us to the M1 Ultra. Since 2020, Apple has been moving their Mac desktops and notebooks away from Intel CPUs and AMD GPUs and over to their own in-house SoCs, taking the same tech from iPhones and integrating it into computers. Apple started with lower end and lower power form factors, but they finally came around to high end desktops with the release of the Ultra a few months ago. Now the M1 Ultra isn't really its own unique chip, however. It's actually two M1 Max SOCs connected over a high bandwidth 2.5 terabyte per second silicon interposer. To the operating system and the user, it seems like one monolithic chip with one CPU and GPU, but in reality this is two chips linked through a first of its kind interposer with enough performance to support a fast dual chip GPU. The Ultra packs a whopping 20 CPU cores, split between 16 performance cores and 4 efficiency cores in a configuration similar to modern Intel designs. While the clock speeds may be lower than desktop PC CPUs, instructions per clock are higher on the performance cores, leading to similar overall performance per core. In its highest end configuration, the 21 teraflop GPU features 64 of Apple's in-house graphics cores, with performance similar to an RTX 3090 according to Apple, although we'll touch on this later. To round things out, the system packs a stunning 800 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth to keep those GPU and CPU cores well fed. The M1 Ultra is only currently available in the Mac Studio desktop computer, which we have here in its maxed out configuration with 128 gigabytes of memory and an eight terabyte SSD. Most interestingly, this computer has a volume of just 3.7 liters, which is truly tiny and only slightly larger than an Xbox Series S. It uses two blower style fans that pull air through a large copper heatsink to dissipate the roughly 200 watts that the system pulls at load, which is a small fraction of the energy used by a high end desktop PC. So let's move on and actually measure how fast this machine is. We're going to start off with gaming tests before closing with productivity benchmarks and synthetics. Is this machine truly as fast as a high end desktop PC or possibly even faster? Unfortunately, there aren't very many high-end Mac games that we can actually test. There are very few Mac games available, particularly when it comes to big budget games. But we do have a few titles here, and the results are intriguing. For our gaming tests, we've got a 16-inch MacBook Pro with the fully enabled M1 Max chip, our maxed out Mac Studio with the M1 Ultra chip, an MSI GP66 gaming laptop, and a high-end desktop PC. There are a few things to look out for here. The M1 Ultra consists of two M1 Max chips, so we should be looking for significant scaling above the Max, perhaps two times scaling in some tests. The GP66 laptop has a mobile RTX 3080 GPU, which according to Apple should offer similar performance to the GPU in the M1 Max. 
Finally, Alex's desktop PC represents a system with a top-end consumer CPU and GPU as a high watermark to measure our system against in terms of absolute performance. Let's start with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. This isn't a native Apple Silicon game as the title is written for x86, so the M1 chips here have to use the Rosetta 2 translation layer to function but it doesn't really seem like that has much of an impact on performance. The benchmark sequence running at max settings at 4K shows the RTX 3080 mobile and M1 Max are neck and neck, while the Ultra falls squarely between the M1 Max and the 3090. The Ultra has solid performance here and reasonable scaling from the Max, but isn't quite holding the line against ultra high-end GPUs. Next up is Metro Exodus. 4A Games' first-person shooter has a decent Mac port, although again it was written for x86. The Ultra splits the PCs here as well, while the Max does a good job of fending off the 3080 Mobile. This is the original version of the game without RT, but running on the highest end preset. Unfortunately, it seems very challenging to disable VSync on M1 based Macs with built in displays, so the MacBook Pro has VSync enabled for these tests. But on the flip side, there do seem to be some very serious problems with frame times and stuttering when VSync is disabled on these M1 Macs. Next up is Total War Warhammer 3. This is another x86 game, but it doesn't seem to hold up quite as well as Metro or Tomb Raider. M1 Ultra is far behind the 3090 here and barely keeps pace with a high-end gaming laptop. Perhaps this can be chalked up to a suboptimal port or problems with the Rosetta translation. But what about native Apple Silicon games? There are remarkably few games for Apple Silicon, and most of them are iOS ports and not really conventional PC software. There is one prominent game that we can test across platforms though, and that's World of Warcraft. This is a full bore Apple Silicon version of Blizzard's long running MMO. The same general performance pattern has come back for us here. The M1 Ultra yet again falls between the two PC systems, although curiously it is falling well short of the expected performance here. The Max is borderline unplayable, while the 3080M hovers around 30fps. All of these systems would be perfectly fine playing World of Warcraft at remotely reasonable settings of course. Here we are running the game essentially maxed out at a whopping 8K internal resolution to create a proper stress test. There is one cross-platform game graphics benchmark that runs natively on Apple Silicon as well, and that's 3D Mark Wildlife Extreme, which renders a set of relatively simple scenes at 4K. Here, the Ultra falls somewhat short of the 3090, but comes in a solid 76% faster than the Max. So ultimately, the M1 Ultra seems to sit somewhere below the 3090 in graphics performance, at least as far as we can tell from benchmarking across operating systems. Typically, you should expect a 60 to 70% performance improvement over the single chip option. Perhaps the interposer is causing some minor hiccups here, as using multiple chips for one GPU requires a massive amount of bandwidth. These results are really just for evaluating raw performance though, as the Mac is not a good gaming platform. Very few games actually end up on Mac, and the ports are often low quality. If there is a future for Mac gaming, it will probably be defined by borrowing games from other platforms, either through wrappers like Wine or through running iOS titles natively, which M1 based Macs are capable of. In the past, Macs could run games by installing Windows through Apple's bootcamp solution. But M1 based chips can't boot natively into any flavor of Windows, not even Windows for ARM. Let's move on to some CPU benchmarks. We've got Blender, Geekbench, Cinebench, and Handbrake lined up here. And the Ultra's results are compelling. We've swapped the GP66 laptop for my desktop computer here, which packs a 10850K. Across these tests, the 12900K and M1 Ultra prove very comparable. The two chips are essentially a match with respect to multi-core performance, though the ultra-high frequencies that 12900K is capable of can give it the edge in some single-threaded tests. The 10850K and M1 Max are closely matched as well. The scaling from M1 Max to M1 Ultra is close to linear across these runs, unlike our graphics benchmarks. On average, M1 Ultra is 88% faster, with some results approaching 100%. Linking up two clusters of cores across an interchip medium is something we've seen in the PC space for years now, and very good scaling is to be expected here. Finally, I thought I'd throw in some real-world benchmarks from a couple of programs I frequently use, Final Cut Pro and Topaz Video Enhance AI. 
we're looking at the two M1 based computers here, as well as a 16 inch 2019 MacBook Pro with an eight core Intel CPU and an AMD RDNA based GPU. The export results are very curious in Final Cut. While both M1 machines trounce the Intel based MacBook, export times are virtually identical across the M1s. So what's going on? With typical Final Cut workloads on M1 chips, export performance seems to be dictated by the hardware's video encoders. The M1 Ultra and Max have the same video encoders, so there's no meaningful performance difference when encoding a ProRes or H.264 video without many effects. To actually see a difference in export times, you would really need to stress the GPU with a lot of effects in motion templates, but even then it would be hard to see a large difference. That isn't to say there aren't big moment-to-moment -moment performance differences though. Final Cut generates video thumbnails in real time on the CPU cores, which occurs nearly instantly on an M1 Ultra and is significantly slower on M1 Max. In general, the timeline is more responsive and the editing process is more fluid, but that won't be reflected in simple export tests. Topaz Video Enhance AI is much more straightforward. We're strictly GPU bound here, and the M1 Ultra shows a solid performance improvement, completing the test 43% faster, though it's not particularly impressive given the doubling of GPU hardware. Both machines do manage to crush the 2019 MacBook Pro, as you probably expect. So the M1 Ultra packs similar performance to the highest end PC chips, trading blows across a variety of metrics. CPU performance is up there with the best Intel has to offer, while the GPU sits one or two rungs beneath the PC performance leaders at the moment. The key metric with M1 Ultra isn't raw performance, however, though it is largely competitive with PCs on that front. It's power consumption. The Ultra manages to pull even with fast PCs, while consuming roughly one quarter to one third the power consumption. The Mac Studio itself only pulls about 200 watts when fully loaded, and usually draws much less. So why is the M1 Ultra so much more efficient than comparable PC designs? Firstly, Apple has a considerable process node advantage over its competitors. By leveraging TSMC's 5 nanometer process, Apple is one to two silicon nodes ahead of its nearest rivals at the moment, which means higher density and lower power consumption for Apple's chips. Apple generally gets access to TSMC's newest processes before their PC competitors and has been producing chips at 5 nanometers for over two years at this point. Secondly, Apple is simply throwing way more silicon at the problem. The M1 Ultra uses a whopping 114 billion transistors across two chips. In contrast, the GA102 GPU in the RTX 3090 packs just 28 billion transistors. With so much more logic, Apple can run their chips at lower clocks and lower voltages and still achieve similar performance. The extremely high density of TSMC's 5 nanometer process helps a lot here. Lastly, Apple's CPU and GPU architectures play a significant role. These are designs that are primarily designed for iPhones and other low power applications. There are likely many mechanisms inside these chips to keep energy consumption in check, including very effective power gating. Given the immense potential of the Apple solution, there's one final question that's worth addressing. Would a move to ARM be practical for the broader PC market as well? After all, Apple achieved an enormous performance improvement when they moved to ARM, so could this be a good solution for PC vendors too? Generally, I think the answer is no, at least not at the moment. There are two major problems here. The things that make Apple's designs effective aren't specific to the ARM instruction set license that they use. These are mostly factors that we've discussed already, their unique high performance architectures and their current process node advantage being the most important. Critically, no one else is currently offering an ARM CPU core design that has the performance to go toe to toe with AMD and Intel. The second problem is the lack of an effective translation layer for x86 code. macOS has Rosetta 2, which is a relatively efficient and broadly compatible solution for running x86 code seamlessly on ARM based Macs. Windows 11 for ARM has a software emulator for x86 programs, but performance is degraded and compatibility is lacking.
The M1 Ultra is an extremely impressive processor. It delivers CPU and GPU performance in line with high-end PCs, packs a first-of-its-kind silicon interposer, consumes very little power, and fits into a truly tiny chassis. There's simply nothing else like it. For users already in the Mac ecosystem, this is a great buy if you have demanding workflows. While the Mac Studio is expensive, it is less costly than the Mac Pro and the iMac Pro, which both packed expensive Intel Xeon processors and ECC RAM. Final Cut, Apple Motion, Photoshop, Handbrake, pretty much everything I use on a daily basis runs very nicely in this machine. For PC users, however, I don't think this particular Apple system should be particularly tempting. While CPU performance is in line with the best from Intel and AMD, GPU performance is a little bit less compelling. Plus, new PC CPUs and GPUs are being released in the next few months that should cement the performance advantage of top-end PC systems. But the M1 Ultra is a one-of-a-kind solution. You won't find this kind of raw performance in a computer this small anywhere else. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and press the bell for YouTube notifications. Check out the Patreon at digitalfinder.net for exclusive and early access content, and to get in touch, just use Twitter. Thanks for watching.